I was in the public health service as a commission officer at the time. And I remember writing some of these equations down, and uh, one of the, the other men, scientists in the public health service, said, you know, that's a model. And that was the first time I heard that word. And I said, what's a model? And he says, well, it's a representation of the Connecticut River. And I said, well, that's interesting. And it was a defining moment. Yeah, a lot of defining moments. I remember him saying, that's a model. I had never heard that word before, even though the equations had been around at that point for, for maybe 50 or 60 years. Bob Toman was one of the founders of water quality modeling in the United States. And modeling, mathematical modeling, has provided one of the biggest success stories in pollution control over the past 30 years. The story of the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes of North America are five large freshwater inland seas on the border between Canada and the USA. Biggest of all, and furthest west, is Lake Superior. South of Superior, and entirely within the USA, is Lake Michigan. Water from both Superior and Michigan flows into Lake Huron. The flow then runs through the Detroit River into Lake Erie, the smallest of the lakes. Finally, it passes over Niagara Falls, through Lake Ontario, and then out into the St. Lawrence River and the Atlantic. The lakes now are very much cleaner than they were in the 50s and 60s, and their traditional use for recreation is regaining its popularity. Lakeside resorts are centers for fishing, sailing and other water-based sport. And the lakes contain fresh water, so they're used to provide drinking water for a large part of the North American population. Much of the political impetus for cleaning up the lakes came from the International Water Quality Agreement, signed in 1972 by Richard Nixon and Pierre Trudeau. In the United States, responsibility for monitoring water quality and advising on changes was given to the Environmental Protection Agency, and much of the modeling work was carried out at their large lakes research lab in Gros Isle, an island in the Detroit River at the northwest tip of Lake Erie. Bill Richardson is former station chief at the lab. I was a, accepted in the public health service, and through the course of my discussions with these fellow students, I became aware of uh, you know, the tremendous pollution problem that was going on in this country. Of course, we discussed that in classes. It was on national news. Kennedy had just been elected president. He was making quite an issue out of this. The state of Michigan was going through turmoil with the pollution problems in the Great Lakes. Actually, the Great Lakes cleanup and whole effort on water pollution control focused on Lake Erie and the Detroit River in the late 50s, early 60s, when there were tremendous oil slicks coming down the river from the, the industries, from the uh, auto plants and the uh, steel industry. Industrial plants like these produce the most obvious forms of pollution. This is River Rouge, just south of metropolitan Detroit, and one of the centers of heavy industry in the state of Michigan. Even now, some of the waste products from these factories are washed down the River Rouge, out into the Detroit River, and then into Lake Erie. But pollution doesn't come only from industry. Much of it is a result of ordinary, everyday life. You could start with uh, bacterial pollution, which is direct result of uh, human sewage, uh, from sewers, uh, combined sewer overflows, which is a combination of rainfall and sewage, and from treatment plants. Uh, sewage also has various kinds of organic material in it that is not of a toxic chemical point of view, but a organic waste that can use up oxygen when discharged to a stream or a lake and that oxygen then impacts, the loss of oxygen impacts the aquatic ecosystem. Then the, the problem of nutrient enrichment from both treatment plants, from humans, because we obviously we discharge nitrogen and phosphorus in our waste, and from agricultural runoff. So bacteriological pollution, organic material that contributes to lowering of oxygen, Nutrient enrichment is another area. And then finally, the uh, toxic chemicals, uh, heavy metals, uh, zinc, mercury, copper, cadmium, which have been around since, since the very beginning, and the newer chemicals, the organic chemicals synthesized by and large since the Second World War, of which there are hundreds of thousands. Uh, so uh, in a very broad category, those are the major pollution problems. 
Some of these newer chemicals are called PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. There are nearly 200 different kinds of PCBs, and they've been used in many different manufacturing processes. The problem that it became more evident in the late 70s, 80s was that of toxic substances. It was determined that PCBs was a major problem, affecting the possible risk for human health. It was determined that children of mothers who ate a lot of Great Lakes fish, the infants were displaying certain abnormalities and characteristics that were very uh, disturbing to people, so it was determined to actually ban PCBs even before we modeled it. The problem with PCBs is that a lot of it was produced since 1929, so it was all out in the environment, in inks, carbonless paper, in uh, fluorescent light fixtures, in industrial oils. Uh, even though we banned the use and manufacture of PCBs in the country, just millions and millions of pounds of this were distributed in the environment. But despite the apparent size of the problem, the environment can often be forgiving. Lake Michigan alone contains 5 million million cubic meters of water, enough to swamp modest amounts of pollution. And the holiday resorts in the north of the lake are 400 kilometers away from the polluting factories of the south. But still, the pollution has to go somewhere. It could decay naturally into harmless substances. It could be washed out to sea by the flow of water. Or it could accumulate. And if it does accumulate, how much of it will there be next year? Or in five years? Or ten years? And what will happen if the input of pollution is restricted? Or if it's stopped altogether? The only way to find out is by modelling. Why model? And what's the options? The options are to guess at what the effectiveness of certain control actions are. Uh, and guessing uh, may be, uh, my guess may be as good as your guess, and that's when controversy arises. So that the, to the degree to which a model provides at least some objective um, assessment of the situation and is credible in the sense that it reproduces observed information, uh, then we might agree that, yes, this kind of technique is a useful way to make uh, assessments of the impacts of various environmental control actions. But without a model, we'd always be flying blind. We'd always be guessing. We'd say, well, maybe on the one hand this, on the other hand that. And then, I mean, it's also sometimes argued, why don't we just go out and measure everything we need to measure and on the basis of the measurements make an assessment of what the impacts will be. Um, well, that's fine up to a certain point. Uh, most of the time, the decisions we're asked to make are to extend um, the environmental controls beyond what we've already observed. So the question is always a forecasting question, a projection question, which we can't, which we can't measure. So measurements by themselves will never answer the question of what, what are the impacts of different kinds of environmental control actions. So hence modeling answers the door. Thank mm -hmm. you.